you're listening to Real Liberty Media. Please feel free to join in on our chat and live streams whenever you can. If not, access all of our podcasts at reallibertymedia.com. And remember, share Real Liberty Media with your friends, family, and on all of your social media outlets. Please help our station grow. And thank you for joining Real Liberty Media. Welcome to the Age of Fission Radio Show with your host, Lonnie Clark. We stand together and accept we now live in a world transformed by the nuclear industry. We expose and confront the intentional neglect and disregard for life on our planet by atomic energy. Consider social engineering programs who view our bodies, minds, and souls as assets on a balance sheet. We discuss vital current issues, interview activists, and engage our audience in an effort to allow all voices to be heard. We encourage our listeners to reclaim their power and their courage to take action to save our planet from the ravages of greed and indifference. Every voice matters. Our actions matter. We remind our listeners that happiness is resistance. Love is greater than fear. Good afternoon. This is Lonnie Clark with the Age of Fission Radio Show. I want to thank all of our listeners and subscribers to listening to our podcast. And please remember that you can hear our podcast, all of my podcasts, uh, show up on my YouTube channel, which is not monetized. I'm not promoting anything here for money. But I definitely want the information to go out, and that is posted at Nuts for Art, N-U-T-Z-F-O-R-A-R-T. And it does post up on Spreaker, which I pay for, but they stick in commercials. So I kind of like going to YouTube to listen to our podcast. (laughs) So anyways, I want to thank you for joining us. I am very, very excited today. Our guest today is Dave Parrish. He has a YouTube channel and a website. His website is called Operation Save the Earth. His YouTube channel is his name, Dave Parrish. He posts up every Friday, uh, Fuku Friday. It's a video called Fuku Fridays, and it's a six-minute update on what's going on in Japan at the Fukushima Daiichi nuclear power plant and how the nuclear radiation is affecting all of Japan. So thank you, Dave, for joining us. Always a pleasure, Lani. Thanks for having me. I am super excited about today's date because you were you came up with a brilliant idea to commemorate the ninth. I get well, I don't want to call it an anniversary, but the ninth year that we are entering into a nuclear collapse at the Fukushima Daiichi nuclear power plant. And uh, why don't you explain it to our listeners? Sure. Well, let's see. As you know, the nuclear disaster at Fukushima Daiichi in Japan started on March 11th, 2011, and we've been in year nine this whole year. Uh, on this Wednesday, the 11th of March, is going to be the culmination of that ninth year, and we're going to be marking it with a special meditation for Fukushima, an online event that is free to everyone. So, um, you know, I hope everybody uh, online or at least you know hear them there's a couple of options that you can tap in to what we're doing we're going to be using easy talks cloud meeting service it's a free app that you can download and we have it set up so that we can have up to 200 people either phone in or or use the app to video in and share in a basically just a meditation uh, it's going to be a guided meditation with my um, spiritual guide uh michael post from samadhi sea of wisdom he is a mindful te- mindfulness teacher he teaches about spirituality he teaches about um meditation just you know how to connect to source and this is just i think a great opportunity for all of us to gather together you know in a collective way and you know try to have an impact on just everything that's going on because of fukushima since march 11 2011 and to remember those that were lost that day. Because, you know, I think a lot of people tend to forget that, you know, uh, anywhere in between 18 and 20,000 people lost their lives on that day yeah. uh, because of the earthquake and tsunami that, that struck Japan. And, you know, it's, it's, it's for the victims that have had to live since then. You know, everyone who's lost 
loved ones, uh, everyone who's had to suffer with what the Japanese government has, you know, given them as, you know, an excuse really for the last nine years of suffering. Yeah. And Dave, there's no real count of how many people have died subsequent to that from the negative reactions of that nuclear meltdown, is there? Not really. No, you know, the sad part is, you know, it's all part of, you know, the whole cover up of the Fukushima nuclear disaster that was implemented in 2011, 2012, uh, a coordinated effort between the State Department here in the United States and the Japanese government. And as a result, you know, literally hundreds of thousands of people in and around the Fukushima area have had to live with hot spot radiation, have had to live with you know, bags and just tons and tons of radioactive waste lining their roads. And, you know, when typhoons come and and breaks the bags open, washes them down the river, nobody says anything about it. Nobody, you know, gives it any any kind of due, any proper due. And, you know, I think that's been kind of the problem since uh, 2011. People just haven't really given it the proper due that it needs. And this is our small way this coming Wednesday to kind of give back and, You know, be mindful, send vibrational energy and love to, you know, everyone who's been touched by this. And whether you choose to see it or not, your lives have been touched by it. Everyone's life has been touched by it. You know, uh, when you go to the grocery store and fish costs way more now than it used to because of scarcity. Guess what? You know, that is a result of what happened on March of 2011 and it's still affecting us today. So. You know, this is, again, this is an opportunity for all of us to gather, whether you're a kooka fighter, whether you don't know anything about it, whether you don't know anything about uh, meditation or not, you know, this is an opportunity just to sit, be still for an hour, listen to what Michael is guiding us through, and, you know, to, to awaken that vibrational energy within all of us, because that's where the true spirit lies, and be able to give that back to the collective in in a grander way. Yeah. Well, I think, you know, for me, it's kind of like throwing spaghetti on the wall. You know what I mean? Like something's got to stick. We have done, I mean, the whole nuclear industry, their intention is to lie to us. This morning I saw a video uh, that posted up from the Manhattan Project for Nuclear Free Planet or Nuclear Free World. Um, A gentleman, he was one of, you know, the Mina No data site, it's this organization of volunteers, over 4,000 volunteers, who collected soil samples from 17 prefectures, prefectures in Japan because the government of Japan basically didn't do any studying. They went up in a helicopter, took the radiation level, and said that's the level on the ground. So right. the citizens were freaked out and got involved and really literally created a, an award-winning book. And... Mm-hmm. Um, he was he made a quick video about their little booklet that's in English. Now he they produced this in English for us and for the English speaking world. And this video the same thing. And I don't know the man's name, but he was one of the volunteers in Tokyo. And he went to a park in central Tokyo. And they mm-hmm. tested sites all over the park, like over twenty places in the park. It was a it, it actually went into the newspaper. He showed us a newspaper article that showed all the spots that they, he had tested. He had taken a test in one spot where it was 8,000 becquerels, uh, 8,000 millisieverts per, you know, millisecond, 8,000, I'm sorry, I'm struggling with the terminology here, 8,000 millisieverts, is that what we call it? And whereas the safe, he said it used to be 2.5 and now it's 8,000 in another part of the park, maybe 30, 40 feet away. It was fifty thousand, and he he was very, he was they were so disturbed. Him and his they, they went up to the people. They saw children playing, and they basically yeah, yeah. explained to the parents in this park and said, "Look, this is not safe." Like they had to show them what they had discovered, and the parents were you know rightly upset. Like <laughs> why would they do this? But at least he warned somebody. But this is. We're about to have the radioactive Olympics in Tokyo. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And yeah. so if that's in Tokyo, imagine what is in Fukushima where they're going to be playing baseball 
and you know relay races they're starting the torch race that we already know that the torch route the guy has to go through highly contaminated zones that even the government yeah. says is contaminated sure you know that that's all part of the mo you know making things seem normal even though they're not and that was I think the biggest concern that I had and a lot of people had when it was announced that the Olympics were going to be held in Tokyo in 2020, back in 2013, after Prime Minister Abe lied to the International uh, Olympic Committee and told them that everything at Fukushima was fine. There would be no problems with any type of radioactivity involved with the uh, Summer Olympics whatsoever. Come on down, you know, spend a lot of money and, you know, make Japan look great. You know, this has all been this sort of calculated move for the last nine years, basically, because they had uh, aspirations to get the Olympics prior to that, obviously, because it, it, it's a process. It takes a long time to get approval and build sites and things like that. And, you know, we were getting reports back in 2013. Certainly, I was looking at reports that said there were hot spots in Tokyo all the time. You know, um, Arnie Gunderson uh, showed us that. Uh, we had all sorts of studies that showed that there were various places, various just little spots where you could be on the street and this little dust particle, with the, you, you can't hardly see it. You, you don't even notice it. This little dust particle is actually this, you know, ionized glass particle, This what they call the black glass problem, where you know it was ejected from the nuclear site at Fukushima Daiichi and sent out into the atmosphere, right? So, oh. and what was this? It's, you know, th these little tiny, almost microscopic size, uh, pieces of glass are really just, you know, this sort of crystallized, you know, radioactive nightmare, basically. You know, because you, if you breathe that in, that stays in there. You know, how's it going to get out? It's really hard once you ingest highly radioactive materials to get it out if you especially if you're not conscious of it right and you know back then you know you had literal doctors say you know what y'all shouldn't be living in tokyo at all anymore and remember back in the early early days lani in 2011 when you know now Khan was the prime minister there and the japanese government was seriously giving thought to the idea of moving the base of government from Tokyo to Kyoto, which is where, you know, the original um, capital was in Japan because of this concern, right? Because, I'm sorry. but, you know, how do you move 15 million people out of a city that's like next to impossible, right? Well, you know, that I think that's you know, sort of the rationale. It's like, oh, we can't move everybody. So let's just stay put and, you know, whoever gets sick is whoever gets sick and blah, blah, blah. You know, we'll, we'll pay off whoever we have to pay off. And TEPCO, the ones who've been in charge of this whole mess this whole time, you know, that they, they last year said we ain't paying no more because the government says we only got to pay this much, right? So all these people who've been trying to get money from TECO, trying to get compensation from TECO because of this disaster, because of the losses that they've suffered, because of what took place March 2011, you know, they're all getting stonewalled now, you know. So, you know, it's this kind of vicious cycle that has been started because of the cover-up, it's still going on to this day. And, you know, let, let's talk about justice because there has been a lack of justice in Japan this whole time. And, you know, you can't just blame the Japanese government. You know, this is a this is a much bigger problem than just them. You know, TEPCO was run by who? You know, uh, shareholders who pretty much happen to be uh, Yakuza mob members. You know, this is a big uh, factor about nuclear that people uh, don't really uh, realize is that, especially in Japan, a lot of nuclear plants have mob ties because it was a good investment for them back in the 70s, right? Hey, you know, here's here's a plant that's going to cost billions of dollars in contracts to build. Hey, you know, guess what? Contracts and building, that, that, that's a, that's an old mob cliche, right? Um, you, you fast forward to uh, March 2011 and, you know, this terrible thing happens that TEPCO and everybody said never could happen, even though their own studies showed that, you know, if a tsunami of a certain height came ashore at, at any time, guess what? That plant was vulnerable. The Tokai plant was vulnerable. The Daini plant was vulnerable. There was a lot of coastal 
plants that were vulnerable and got hit by this uh, in 2011. So, you know, the uh, I always say, you know, when when uh, the mob is in charge of the nuclear power industry, it's like having uh, the ice cream man in charge of putting out a forest fire. You know, that little truck isn't going to do so much. You know, handing out bomb pops is nice and everything, but you got a forest fire here, and you know, you are not equipped. You're not properly prepared for the ramifications of everything that is to follow. There is so much. I mean, this is the thing. Fukushima is so gigantic. It was like the first. Ironically, you know, they say that nuclear power plants are safe, but we have a disaster about every 10 years. And this is the ninth yeah. anniversary, oh. meaning we're due. We are due for one. Something is about to happen somewhere big on top of what since Fukushima. I mean, Fukushima woke people up. That's kind of what the downside for the nuclear industry is. People started to go, wait a minute, like, what's going on here? And people started paying attention. So now we know, like, reports are coming out. I saw an article yesterday that talked about the nuclear contamination up in the Arctic. It turns out that there was over 17, the 1,700 articles of highly contaminated pieces of equipment and barrels of nuclear waste buried in the Arctic that now that it's melting up there, mm -hmm. you know, the Russians used it kind of as their dumping ground for the nuclear mess that they were creating. Uh, you know, they take it out there and just pour it in the ice, and bye bye they thought it would stay there forever because it's the Arctic. They didn't count on us losing the Arctic. And so now there's this urgency to move this stuff because these things are highly... But they were talking again. They used the same terms as they did in Fukushima. The article said that they look think it's going to take about forty years to move. It. <laughs> I started laughing yeah. when I read that. You know, when they say it takes forty years, that pretty much means they have no idea what they're doing. <laughs> oh sure, yeah. I mean, because obviously the technology needed hasn't been developed yet. The same problem that Fukushima Daiichi. They keep saying, "Oh, it'll be thirty or forty years." You know, that that just it's the torch really. You know, it's already been 10 years, you know, so technically it should only, only be 30 more years, right? Guess what? Wrong. You know, this is a hundreds of year problem because look at Chernobyl, right? Two years ago, they put another covering over the top of the Chernobyl site because the old one was collapsing, right? And when this one that they put, they just put on at the cost of like, what, $1.2 billion or something like that. It was a, the entire European Union kicked in money to build this gigantic, you know, structure to slide over the top of Chernobyl. You know, it's something that that's their policy for years and years and years and years to come. When this structure falls down, the one that just got put up, they got to put up another one over the top of that one and then another one and another one, another one, because this radiation it it the decay on the half life of it is so long it's thousands of years Lonnie you know this you know but most people don't you know most people think you know oh nuclear energy it's not just, just you know, thousands hundreds of thousands garbage in and garbage out you know it's just, uh, I mean, it is, it is, art. and the thing is, the level of harm that it causes is intense. Like, I, there's an article this month in Counterpunch by Chris Busby about the cancer in the USS Reagan. The U.S. nuclear powered ships, turns out the cancer rates are nine times higher for the USS Reagan than what they expected. And this goes against everything that they said. You know, they are, there's 30% more cancers in the control group after adjusting for a a aging. I mean, and the hard part is for those nuclear victims, they have nowhere to go because they were soldiers. And the United States government basically said, you have to go sue the government of Japan. Mm -hmm. You can't do yeah. There's nothing we can do here for you. We sent you in there. You were our soldiers, our charges, but... We're not responsible for you now that you're really, really sick. It's their fault. I mean, it is It is really, this is the, I call this the nuclear denial, Dave. I just, mm. this is why yeah. I'm really looking forward to the meditation center because part of what I want to really concentrate on is breaking the nuclear denial, giving people the courage to um, stand up to the nuclear industry because really, 
what we're talking about is not just the nuclear industry. We're talking about the industrial military complex. I mean, okay. that that's essentially why we have nuclear power plants, so that they can get that spent uranium fuel. Yeah, exactly. You know, and it, I think you really touched on it there, Lonnie. The uh, soldiers who have been subject to these guinea pig experiments, it's not just what happened on March 11th and all those sailors from Operation Tamadachi who have still yet to get their day in court, who have gotten no justice uh, to this day. And as the son of a retired Navy man myself, I am just appalled by the uh, poor um, uh, reception that their lawsuit got here in the United States and even more so by it having to be shifted to Japanese mainland to get further prosecution. There is a very big problem with nuclear and military in the United States. The U.S. Navy has gone all in on nukes, obviously, with a lot of their um, submarine fleet. You're going to have, you know, nuclear-powered generators to keep those things going forever and ever. And I think the the big thing is, Lonnie, that there's this mythology that nuclear is safe. You know, that's what they were pushing with Atoms for Peace. Don't worry. It, it won't be bad. You know, even if something goes wrong, it still won't be bad, mm-hmm. right? Look at what happened at Three Mile Island in Pennsylvania, 1979. Oh, you know, everybody just shelter in place for a few days. It'll be fine. President Carter comes through. Yeah, we are supposed to shut this down, but the nuclear power industry is has so much sway over so many things, monetarily, militarily, where it's just like you you have to keep going along with it. You know, you, you bought into it. You have to keep going uh, on with it. And, you know, our argument here, our argument as Fuku fighters has been the whole time is like, no, you do not. You know, at, mankind got along just fine for literally thousands of years without nukes, right? And it's only in the past 60 that nukes have been what they have been, a gigantic problem that causes cancer, that causes injustice, that causes suffering all across the board. Literally hundreds of thousands of people have died because of various cancers that are directly related to exposure to low-dose radiation and its ilk for the past 50 years, ever Mm -hmm. since the bombing of Hiroshima and Nagasaki going forward. You know what you occurs to me? It's a straight line going right back to the beginning of the uh, atomic age to today where you can see the rise of cancer. And, you know, if you don't look at that correlation and see it for, for what it is, I don't know. I don't know what you're paying attention to. Well, that's the key, isn't it? And I mean, that's what about what I was about to say is like what occurs to me is since the introduction of nuclear, the... I mean, really, honestly, what I've seen is a a tremendous lack of integrity by military leaders to promote the status quo so that they can get their war machine, keep their war machine. I mean, right now, I mean, this is, in fact, what's harming the first world and especially the United States is the is is really the war machine i mean it is there yeah. is all war all the time today the news came out that we have been lied to about what happened in afghanistan from mm-hmm. presidents to generals which leads me to believe that i mean this is the thing our generals the on the uss reagan the commanding officers did not tell their soldiers they were headed into a nuclear contaminated zone no, they didn't. The right. soldiers found out when they got back in and were told to strip, and their clothes went in into, you know, a, a, a container specifically meant for radioactive contamination. They weren't told. They were. I mean, it is such a sideswipe, and and really, it is a lack. Of, it to me, it's everything antithetical that we remember. We think that the United States government was based on honor, integrity, honesty. I mean. Our country is so far away. This establishment is just lie at all costs because if you're rich, you're you're not going to be held accountable. This just the way it is. If if you have money, if you're a person in power, you get to do pretty much whatever you want. I mean, it is a free for all, and especially with nuclear contamination, they, I, I, it, it blows me away for me to think 
that all these people that have lots of money that are going to go to the Olympic Games think they're going to go there and protect themselves, that they're not going to be affected. Sure. Yeah, I mean, uh, why? Because they've been told that everything's safe, everything's fine, right? Prime Minister Abe said, don't worry about it, you'll be fine. So... You know, well, Dave, I want to remind people that we're listening. You're listening to uh, Lonnie Clark with Dave Parrish from Operation Save the Earth, and you're listening to the Age of Fission Radio Show. And I want to remind people that on March 11th, 2020, that's two days from now, on Wednesday, at 11 a.m. Pacific Standard Time, 2 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. People can log in to easytalks.com. You don't have to put the app on your phone. If you want to, you can. Uh, But you can just log in from your computer and go to easytalks.com. And then they look for the topic of Dave Parrish's meeting, Dave. Is that the idea? That's right. And it's called Dave Dave Parrish's meeting, Dave, P-A-R-R-I-S-H, Dave Parrish's meeting. It'll take you in there. It's a free call, and it'll link you in. I'll give you the meeting ID number right now. It's 1941675. If you're interested, and if you can't get to a computer, you can phone call. So the number is 201-439-8092. And that is 201-439-8092. This is going to be a lead meditation, a meditation session for one hour by Michael Post of the Samadhi Sea of Wisdom. And I have no idea what he's going to do, but my intention is to go in there and meditate for answers and for the people that are lying to us to grow a conscience and to decide that they're going to stop with the lies. Because, you know, it's like we tell our kids, when you're on the wrong road, you can always turn around. We're on the wrong yeah. road, folks. We need to turn around really badly. We need to turn around. Yeah, exactly. And, you know, I think you really hit the nail on the head there, Lonnie. This is an opportunity for everyone to gain a little bit more insight because, like we were just talking about, you know, there's so much ignorance about the problem still at Fukushima. I mean, I've, I've run into people even recently who I tell them about it, and they have absolutely no idea that anything like that occurred. You know, the the cover-up was so pervasive and has been so effective over the years that, you know, there are still people on this planet that don't know what happened in March of 2011 in Japan. Or they think that it's not that bad. They think it's pretty much taken care of because we're having the Olympics there. Like, it can't be that bad because we're having the Olympics there. Like, literally. I mean... I'm part of their plan. You know, and and let me, about your meditation session, Dave, because this came up with someone that I spoke to recently. If you're a Christian and you're listening to this and your religion tells you that you can't meditate, I encourage you to please join us at 11 a.m. in a prayer meeting. You don't even have to log in to us, but just take that time at 11 a.m. Pacific Standard Time for one hour to just pray or meditate, even if you can't log in. Do what you can to calm your mind and join forces with us on a mental level and a spiritual level so that we can find solutions and and create a faster solution. Because us ignoring this problem, I mean, essentially what's interesting is there's a lot of activists that are not ignoring the problem post-Fukushima. So the stories are coming out like... The story about, you know, uh, Chris Busby now gets to, you know, he wrote these articles. And Counterpunch is actually one of the best places to go to look for nuclear stuff. But, you know, there's there's other things that are happening where people are were exposing. Like that story that I read, it popped up on Google News that the, although it was to demean Russia, that the Russians basically buried all this contaminated waste. Last week it came out that... Hanford, you know, the plutonium tanks that they shut down 30, 40 years ago in Hanford, um, they they basically have never examined them for 50 years. And so now that, because what they had at Hanford, they built these eight plutonium processing plants right on, right next to the river, right to the edge of the river. 
And then they discovered after about five or six years of processing plutonium that the river was getting really, really, really badly contaminated. So the state of Washington insisted that they move them in. So they moved them in and they put all the stuff in these buildings. They closed it down, put it all in these buildings and basically shook their hands off and never went back. And they're discovering that these buildings have never been examined and now they're collapsing. <laughs> like, oh, wow. What a shocker. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it is, well, well, it's, it's incomprehensibly in irresponsible. It is like yeah. beyond irresponsible. And it, to me, it, it's, it's, it's the emperor has no clothes idea. It's kind of like, I mean, not to bring this guy into it, but it's sort of like the coronavirus idea. Like, if you just pretend it's not there, then nobody's going to get really sick. And if you do get sick, it's not really that bad, unless you die. Yeah. I mean, and then it's, it's your own death. Yeah. That's, I mean, this is exactly the story that they do with this with nuclear. They basically just deny that it's very harmful. If you do get sick, yep. don't worry, it's not that bad. And then if you die, it's, well, what did you do wrong with yourself? Exactly. I mean, if you look at the entire history of nuclear, Lonnie, it has been one of cover-ups and obfuscation yep. from the jump, right? I mean, from the after get-go. Madame Curie passed away, you know, what did they do? They just shut up her, her, her shop and nobody went in there, right? So, obviously, because if you did, you would get sick like she and, and her husband did. So, you know, there's... There is just a lot of well, stuff about nuclear. You know, in the oral history of human uh, experimentation that I read by John Goffman, mm. it was yep. done conducted in the late 60s by the energy uh, head of the energy department. She, it was, I forget her last name. Her first name was Hazel. That's how I remember it, though. She came into this uh, in the 60s. She came into her office and discovered that they had – all of the nuclear boxes, all the testing of all the nuclear, anything related to nuclear was just completely disheveled and shoved everywhere. And they, she mm-hmm. did not find a single signature of any authority to have human beings tested, even though the United States had been actively testing human beings. And this is the shocker. John Goffman said as soon as they discovered the nuclear and the atom, and we're talking about the beginning of the century, they started testing humans. The United States government, if you were born in a big city, your baby was exposed to nuclear uh, contamination because they would experiment on babies. Unbeknownst to parents, it didn't even occur to them to ask for the parents' permission until the 40s. And this, his, he posits that this is why, and this, remember, this was, he gave this oral history in the 60s. Uh, it was in the 70s, I beg your pardon. He posits that really, they, it didn't even occur to them to ask for parents' permission. And he said he thinks that a lot of the old people that get these weird cancers and these weird diseases, it's because they were tested as infants. For the ah. first 24 hours of their lives, they had like weird, there was a whole variety. He went on in this in this booklet that I found. I read it on my YouTube channel. It, it, there was a variety of testing that they did on infants, a whole different types of testing. And he said he really thinks that that's why the elderly people now are, even though they, they live old, Many of them have had weird diseases, autoimmune diseases. It increased the sterility. I mean, it's... There is so much that we don't even know about that, I mean, this is the downside to allowing a permanent military. And this is why our forefathers really didn't want to have a standing army, <laughs> you know? Right. Yeah, you know, that, that, that's what imperialist countries did. You know, they, they had those. And I remember uh, growing up in the 70s, Lonnie, you know, after the Vietnam War was over, you know, there was that real brief moment in time when the United States just wasn't at war, right? And it was a nice time. It was a good time. And uh, the problem came in the 80s when, you know, economics were kind of like, you know, on the downside. And I I remember hearing a lot of older folks say, oh, well, we just needed to get another war going because that'll kickstart the economy. And that sort of mindset 
has sort of permeated ever since, right? I mean, we've been in Afghanistan for 19 years now, 19 years at war with a country that doesn't have a standing army. It just has rebels who are sick and tired of uh, everybody else coming into their country and trying to take it over. I'm Not like, even that. The, the crisis is happening today. Today it's reported that, you know, the, the U.S. government way, made a, quote, peace deal with the Afghani government, but they didn't include the Afghani, I mean, excuse me, they made a peace deal with the Taliban, but they didn't make a, they didn't include the Afghani government in the peace talks. So part of what they agreed to with the Taliban was that the Afghanistan government would release prisoners, soldiers. Mm -hmm. And so the Afghan government's going, we're not releasing anybody. So, and then on top of that, in Afghanistan, they're having two inaugurations today because the president refuses to leave. He swears, this is probably what's going to happen to us come November. They're having two inaugural inauguration ceremonies in Afghanistan today. It's a real crisis because the government, there's no smooth transition of power. And so it's right. it's a, it's really it's a complete I mean to be honest there's a lot of very evil men like Eric Prince who have mm-hmm. high mm-hmm. influence in this government. To Betsy DeVos is his sister. They often say, "Oh, well, Eric Prince, he's Betsy DeVos's sister." Well, he's more than that. He's a war criminal. In Iraq and Afghanistan, it was well known that he murdered innocent cit- citizens and and civilians. Very well known. Yep. And he's he's President yep. Trump's advisor. So it's you know we're, we're I mean I guess this is the hard part for me as an American to realize like we're the evil people now. Like our government is oh. super bad. We can't even conduct democracy in our own country. In California, three million votes were not counted in the primary. And in Texas, they're asking to have, once they discovered 3 million votes in California have not been counted, some Texas counties are going, wait a minute, we want to count our ballots all over again. They're insisting on it. Mm-hmm. So yeah. we're, we're really, now, what, we're what, really what, in a, this is why I'm so grateful for the meditation portion of this deal because you know what, really? Mm-hmm. These are these are anxiety making issues that are literally not just our life and death issues, but we're talking hundreds of thousands of years of serious issues where we need to stop messing around and stop lying to ourselves. If we have, mm-hmm. if we want our children to have a chance at having a future at all, we have got to right. stop as a as a species. Stop pretending. Stop pretending everything's okay because it is not okay. We've messed it up really badly in the last 200 years, period. Yeah, why Why do you think the kids are, you know, marching in the streets every Friday now, you know, for, for climate change? Because they get it. They understand it. They know that they're going to have to do the heavy lifting on this problem. And they're they're starting now. You know, teenagers are like, you know, I'm not going to be at school today. I'm going to be out in the street protesting. You know, that is encouraging to see. It's sad that it's gotten to this point because we have sort of delivered this to them. But by the same token, because they have the technology, because they're so savvy, because they're so in the know, they are not, you know, allowing themselves to be sleeping sheep. They are, you know, being proactive about things. They are the ones that are going to make all the changes that we have necessary coming forward because, you know, this whole status quo, keeping things, you know, uh, as they are moving forward, you know, that is not going to work, especially with this problem. You know, this climate change problem is directly related to the nuclear problem. People don't even want to acknowledge that, but that is a genuine fact. You know, if you're using a boiling water reactor, Lonnie, you know this, boiling water reactor does what to the water? heats up the water where does the water go when it's when it's all done gets vented out somewhere right that's hot water you take regular tap water whatever water they're they're using regular water that they uh source into the plant it's regular uh temperature water right when it's released it's higher temperature water 
And you don't think that's going to have an impact over uh, the course of uh, the environment and the planet, and especially in the uh, uh, immediate area there? You're crazy. Right. You're crazy if you think that doesn't impact it because it sure as heck does. I mean, look at the coastal nuclear plants. Look at San Onofre, you know, when you're venting all that hot water directly into the Pacific Ocean. Yeah. Who does that affect? That affects every marine creature that's within how many miles of that venting? Right? Yeah. And, you know, that hot water. Why is there a hot blob of energy water uh, on on the uh, Pacific coast of Alaska and Canada right now? Oh, gee, I don't know. Where did that come from? Where, well, did, that, where did all that energy come from? Oh, I don't know. From the quadrillions of becquerels of radionuclides that were released by Fukushima Daiichi in March of 2011. Uh, and brought the rest of that year because people forget, you know, it's like, oh, it was only one day. No, you had four explosions that took place, and the water has literally been leaking out of there ever since then. Over 3,200 days later, it's still going. Water mm-hmm. is still, and this is what, again, hot water, radioactive water, the radionuclide flowing into the ocean. Why do you think they've had to pour concrete? over the top of everything. Everything. If you look at the map, everything is concrete there. I was about to ask you this. You know about the city of Futaba? They are reopening a small portion of Futaba for the Olympics Mm -hmm. to make it look normal. That's like literally two and a half miles away from the nuclear power facility. They are going to let people in two and a half miles. They don't even do this in Chernobyl. Like, this is the interesting thing. Only this, since Fukushima, have they started thinking about letting people near Chernobyl. Prior to Fukushima, Chernobyl was, like, seriously the big no-go zone. Right. So it's about changing people's minds about, oh, well, nuclear contamination isn't that really that harmful. I mean, it's. It is really irresponsible. It is completely inhumane and irresponsible. It's to me it's yeah. it's it really speaks to exactly like what we've disco- discovered about the Afghanistan war, which is why I brought it up. Because mm-hmm. we have people of high responsibility, generals, the presidents, everybody along the food chain you know, imagine, it wasn't just the generals and, and the presidents who lied to us. Congress knew. The, the 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 super eight, the people who are in the know, you know, the ones who get to know all the real information, they knew. So this means that everybody clicked their heels and said, Sig Heil, and we're just going to mm-hmm. harm the entire planet. Mm-hmm. You know, the IAEA the is now encouraging... Mm-hmm. Fukushima Daiichi to unload all of those tanks of water into the Pacific Ocean, and they plan on doing it. Oh, sure. Yeah, I mean, no, but this this whole water situation at Fukushima Daiichi has been a bugaboo for years and years and years. I mean, going back to 2014, I, I remember articles, oh, we're going to have to release the water, and of course, you know, locals were like, you better not, la, 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 right? It's been this back and forth this whole time. The, the thing that I have been uh, uh, concerned about is that nobody's looking for other solutions. You know, it's like, oh, we need to release the water. Oh, we could try to evaporate it, but you still have the same problem as releasing it. So, you know, instead of actually treating and storing the water and doing something really, you know, to, uh, well, we're going to you know, keep an eye on this water for how many decades and blah, blah, blah. Instead of, you know, taking that responsibility, it's like, nah, no, let's just dump it. You know, it it won't be that bad. The solution to pollution is dilution, right? Um, But, you know, it's it's this problem, the water problem, that has just plagued us this whole time. I mean, remember back in 2015, 2016, Lonnie, it was was this old saying, another week, another leak at Fukushima Daiichi, right? Because, oh, this hose went down or this rat ate this and blah, 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 blah. There's always something going on there. And... You know, the government is like, no, you know, we're all about reconstruction. This is the mindset that they had after World War II. We're just going to rebuild. We're going to put a lot of money into it. And we're just going to rebuild, 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 and make it look like everything is fine. Well, here's the problem with this reopening of these areas in Fukushima Prefecture, like Futaba, which is just down the road from the plant site. You know, it's really just PR because, you know, 
Prime Minister Abe goes to Futaba this past weekend, says, oh, we're going to be reopening. Oh, we can't wait to have the Olympics, uh, uh, the torch relay come run, come through here. Yeah, and you know what? That's going to be a little photo op for five minutes while the people are running and while the people are on the on the sides of the road clapping that they, you know, very carefully try to m- remove all the radioactive hotspots from anywhere around that and make it look, oh, look, everything's normal in Fukushima, right? After the fact, after that photo op is done, where is Futaba? The same place that all of these other evacuation zones that, you know, it's, oh, the evacuation's been lifted. You have no services, and only the elderly can stay there for a certain hours during the day. Wow. Is that really reopening? Is that really reconstructing? Is that really, you know, bringing back community? No, no, and no, because that that's not really what it's about. It's about lip service. It's about, you know, making things seem like that they're recovery when it's certainly not. Well, you know, it it really is all about just they one person does something wrong and then that becomes the standard. That's really it. Like the head of the IAEA, his name and what's his name? Rafael Grossi. That's his Grossi. name. Yeah. Rafael Grossi. He took a tour of the Fukushima Daiichi plant recently and said, "Yeah, you guys mm-hmm. can release the water because we've taken out most of the contaminants except for tritium because tritium is H two three, so you can't get rid of that, and it's not it's okay. relatively harmless." It's relatively non-toxic, so don't worry about it. And so now they're trying to figure out ways to unload all of those tanks. And he's basically, he said, you know, it's common practice to release the water from nuclear power plants across the globe, even when they're not in emergency situations. So this is what's really weird is they do actually release the water from nuclear power plants and this is why there's dead zones around every nuclear power plant because they release the water. Right. And you know th- this whole myth that tritiated water won't harm you, that H- H3O is perfectly fine. I'm like, "Come on, man. You know, how much of the human body is actually made up of water? Guess what? Most of it, right? So if you're going to introduce radionuclides into that mix on a consistent basis, I mean, if, if if you drink H3O every single day, do you think that's really healthy for you? Do you really think that's healthy for you? Because if you do, I got studies that can show you otherwise, right? You know, this whole thing where Mr. Grossi is like, you know, oh, it meets international standards to release this water. I'm like, really, Mr. Grossi? When is the last time water been used uh, in the, in this kind of way before? When have we had a triple meltdown disaster where you have to pour water over the melted radioactive non-stop for nine years thank you and i'm like you know where's the international standard on that this is a new international standard that says that guess what you know this alp system to remove all this uh radioactive material from the water is only partially effective that's right right. all of those tanks that they and there's tons and tons of water tanks there at fukushima daiichi plant site now all of them have the same alps filtered water right and we've seen it uh, two years ago remember the report that came out that said that showed that you know the water yes it has tritium in it but it also has traces of uh, cesium traces of strontium traces of americium traces of all these other radionuclides that you know have just persisted ever since then and the alp system didn't catch obviously right so and that's every single tank Right. And we don't know exactly how much of this radioactive material is in every single tank. We don't have readings for that. We have not been given that information by TEPCO or the Japanese government or the IAEA this whole time. Well, what's interesting is they're very vague. They say, well, we've taken out most contaminants except for tritium. But it's not just tritium that they can't take out. There's other things that still trace elements in there. So it is really a propagandistic lie to say that they're, oh, it's just tritium in the water. No, it's not. It, and on top of that, there's also a lot of chemicals that's going to be released because in this nuclear yeah. stew are chemicals that are mixed in there. It's a, This is not a good idea to be dumping hundreds of millions of, probably billions of gallons by now. I mean, it is. And yet, at the same time, I can understand why they would say that, Dave, because this is not a situation 
Japan's an island. They can't keep stacking, ta- you know, tanks up there. It's going to take up the... If they were to realistically put, continue to take the tanks until they cool down for the next hundred years, Japan would just be one complete tank farm. Right. Yeah. But, so, I mean, isn't it time to get serious on that level, Japan? Instead of, you know, wasting hundreds of millions of dollars building new stadiums for the Summer Olympics that lasts for two weeks, why not, oh, I don't know, invest that money in solutions at Fukushima Daiichi, you know, in real uh, opportunities to stop what has been happening for the past 3,200 X number of days. Because as long as the water keeps flowing, as long as the radionuclides keep popping out of reactors one, two, and three there into the atmosphere, this problem is a forever problem. Yeah. You see, and by not you know, acknowledging it as such by not, you know, inviting an international consortium to come in and, you know, do make those hard decisions that are needed, make make the big calls that are needed. Because what happened in Chernobyl, right? The, the um, Russian uh, Politburo said, hey, guess what? This is a massive problem that is going to destroy the Soviet Union unless we throw everything we've got at it. And that's exactly what they did. They're doing the exact opposite thing in Japan. They're trying to sweep it under the rug, and there's no rug big enough on the planet that you can fit this thing under without it, you know, being very obviously a problem. It doesn't. It's just not possible. So what we need to do is pull back this veil of lies and obfuscation about nuclear, about what really happened at Fukushima Daiichi, and how do we do that? It's very simple. We all gather this Wednesday. And we meditate on it. And I know that, you know, for some people, meditation is a lot of woo-woo. But let let me tell you something. You know, it's a very powerful thing. Because if you do it the right way, it's not just sitting and breathing uh, and and being still. That's the beginning, right? It's when you go inside and you reach out from there while you're meditating. You know, it's like prayer. It's very much like prayer because you are in, in a communal state. You are trying to use your energy to reach out to someone. I mean, isn't that what you do in prayer? When you're calling on your Lord or whichever deity it is, it, you know, that's, that's what prayer is, right? You're trying to open a dialogue there. It's the same with meditation, only you can do so on a scale that goes well beyond just one-on-one. You know, with what we're trying to do on Wednesday is bring a collective together and like I said, let, let Michael guide us through the process in that hour so that we're all vibrating on that same space and being able to channel that energy, direct that energy, and send it out to where it needs to be so that we can destroy this veil once and for all, so that we can pierce past that and show everybody with clarity what is really truly going on and how we can prevent it from ever happening again. Because like you said earlier, Lonnie, it's not a matter of if, it is a matter of when the next nuclear disaster Mm -hmm. is going to take place. Even the World Health Organization confirmed that in 2014, 2015, when they put out reports saying the exact same thing. So Mm -hmm. instead of just allowing that and going, oh, well, Texas, oh, well, Tennessee, Oh, well, New York, wherever it's going to take place, you know, how about, you know, let's take the steps now to make sure that it doesn't happen. Let's take the steps now so that none of our kids will ever have to deal with this the way that we have, right? right? We can shut down every single reactor on the planet and still get all the energy that we need from other means. There's all sorts of technologies that are coming down the pike right now that are going to be way more cost efficient than nuclear and provide us with everything that we need going forward. I don't see any reason why we should rely on nukes anymore at this point. And this has always been my message to the bad guys. Really, you have invested billions of dollars into this technology over the past 70 years. It is now old tech. It is time to reinvest yeah. that money. It is time it's to not very that money effective. out of the Right. And, I and saw an article yesterday that said I saw an article yesterday that said renewable energy has surpassed the output of all nuclear power around the entire world. So nuclear is really <laughs> is dead. So listen, we're running out of time, Dave. I want to remind people again 
go to easytalks.com on March 11th at 11 a.m. and look for Dave Parrish's meeting. You can call in if you want to at 201-439-8092. The meeting ID number is 1941675050. And you can reach Dave and sign up for Dave's uh on Dave's website Operation Save the Earth. He sends you a weekly uh, email and a link to his weekly podcast on YouTube. Very, very, very informative. It will help you get informed. And I, you know, I actually really appreciate the work you're doing, Dave. It's been phenomenal. Thank you. I appreciate that. And I also appreciate everything that you do, Lonnie, and all the food providers, because without your content and sacrifice of time and everything that you do, for the greater good, I wouldn't be able to do what I do because I get all that information. I just, you know, put it out in a palatable way for everyone to see on Fridays with the Fuka Friday show, and I take all that information and, and put it into the newsletter that goes out uh, every Monday as well. So, you know, keep doing what you're doing, guys. You know, it, that's what's important. Don't think that we haven't had an impact on this because, boy, howdy, we sure have. Yes, this isn't 1986 have. anymore with Chernobyl, and nobody knew nothing about nothing back then. We live in 2020 now. We all have the Internet. It's at our fingertips, and we have more power now than we ever have in human history. So use that power. Continue to do the things that you're doing. And don't forget to come and, and join us on Wednesday because it's going to be an, an amazing event, and I think everyone's going to get something. I have a question. Do we call in a few minutes early at 11? Will it start right at 11? Our goal is to start right at 11 Pacific. That's 2 p.m. Eastern, Should all we, around the world. Can we call in like 10 time. or 15 minutes early then? Um, all it's going to say if you do that is uh, they're waiting for the meeting. To oh, start. okay. So, so you can't get in yeah. before 11. I get you. Okay, good, good, good. Right. Okay. Okay, so 11 it is. Well, Dave, this has been truly awesome. I really have to say I really am so grateful you came up with this idea. It was like a breath of fresh air for me other than just the usual let's go protest. <laughs> so I really yeah, right. loved it. <laughs> so thank you so much. And I'm going to put this out on my YouTube channel tonight, and I'm going to send it to KEPW uh, 97.3 FM LP here in Eugene, Oregon. They said they'd be able to get it on the air before Thursday when my show normally starts. And it will be oh, on great. Real Liberty Media at 8 a.m. on Wednesday. So I really appreciate you, Dave, and uh, I hope to talk to you soon. My show's going to have a new name in the next couple of months. I'm coming up with a new name because I think the name Fission sort of puts people off. So I'm going to uh, rename this podcast and just keep doing it. So <laughs> I appreciate all your work. Yeah. Well, Dave, thanks I a lot. You. Okay, well, we'll talk to you soon, Dave. Thanks so much. Thank you. Put your courage feet on, you guys. We'll talk to you soon. Bye-bye. Thank you for joining the Age of Vision radio show with your host, Lonnie Clark. We'll be back next week to bring you more information about the nuclear industry and the harm it's causing our planet and humanity. Find all of our podcasts on Spreaker.com or on YouTube at Nuts for Art, N-U-T-Z-F-O-R-A-R-T. Thank you for being part of the solution. You're listening to Real Liberty Media. Please feel free to join in on our chat and live streams whenever you can. If not, access all of our podcasts at reallibertymedia.com. And remember, share Real Liberty Media with your friends, family, and on all of your social media outlets. Please help our station grow. And thank you for joining Real Liberty Media.